grace and peace be unto you, children of God, from our Father and from the Lord Jesus the Christ. You know, I always thank God on your behalf for his grace, that in all things you are enriched by him, so you won't be lacking in any gift. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephanie. Welcome to the Master's Touch Masterclass. These classes are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God. And if you can't make it at the time of our broadcast, then know that these messages are archived for your study convenience. God bless you richly as we begin to enter God's presence. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we become uh, uh, steeped and soaked in your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts as we enter in. Through, uh, just flowing through our lips and we exalt and praise you and your holy name and Lord we thank you for the hearts and the minds that are hungering for you and your your word and actually to know your will we praise you for our Lord and Savior your only son Jesus the Christ and his finished work on the cross on our behalf thank you Lord for revelation knowledge your rhema word the logos word and the gift of utterance bless those that have ears to hear Lord as you impart wisdom through your word in the name above all names the matchless name of Jesus the Christ we pray amen my friends, did you come expecting to receive today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God. Elevate your expectation level, my friends, and you'll come away with a greater revelation and a greater heart and mind connection. Now, today we're going to continue in our series on dying to self. By studying what is meant by that phrase, we hope to enlighten the believers to the truth of why we must die to self. Before we begin, we must come into the presence of God fully, and um, in order to gain that message... Uh, totally. So what we really want to do then is soak in um, in uh, worship. You know, just, just get in his presence and soak in it. So that's what we're going to do. And uh, we're going to just get with me here and let's soak right now. Well, we found last time that we met the essence of, of a being's existence has to do with the fact that he is a living reality. I'll say it again. The essence of a being's existence has to do with the fact that he is a living reality. If a person no longer has or exhibits the functions of vitality, they are said to be, uh, well, actually, to, to no longer exist. All right. So the essence of death is the absence of life. Therefore, when one dies, one ceases to exist. Now, to carry the argument into the spiritual realm, when someone spiritually dies to self, self ceases to exist. 
That is, self is no longer the reason for one's existence. Now, as such, the individual is no longer concerned with his own will or happiness because he is no longer in the picture. He is no longer the center of his own verse, universe. He no longer continues to arrange the world around himself. Actually, once when um, once one realizes that he has died to self, he should realize that through the world he has already died and gone to heaven. In reality, he is only still here waiting for Jesus to bring him his glorified body so he can go on home. The individual who dies to self understands that God created him for a reason, that he is part of God's plan for the world. Now to be used of God, one must understand the essence of who he now really is and how it is that God can use him. Every genuine child of God wants to be used by God to accomplish his purposes in the world. And Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. John 15 verse 8. Now, that's the essence of God's plan. We are saved to bear fruit created in Christ Jesus for good works, Ephesians 2.10. So we bear fruit when Christ lives his life in and through us. Evidence, John 15.5 and Galatians 2.20. Now, the Apostle Paul said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain, Philippians 1.21. So the Lord wants us to live a godly and spiritually productive, happy life. The world's philosophy says live for self, but God's word says die to self. We must also remember that we cannot rid ourselves of the flesh on this earth. It's still with us, and if we don't exercise extreme care, we'll serve it. But we don't have to. By voiding uh, our allegiance to the flesh, we can, by God's grace, be set free to serve Christ. How do we void our former allegiance to our flesh? Paul says death is the only means. He explains it carefully in Romans 7, verses 1 through 6. Now, study that passage carefully. The point is that unless we are absolutely convinced the flesh is a destroyer, we will continue to listen to it, follow it, and serve it. So as Christians, we're technically free from its ruling over us, but we can still serve the old self. The real question is, do we really hate the flesh? Are you really convinced of such? You know, St. Paul convincingly set forth this, this case in the last part of Romans 7 and in the early part of Romans 8. Whenever Paul would go by the old nature, he would serve his own flesh and bear evil results. But he wanted to serve Christ. Romans 7, which brings forth the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. The, the, uh, the flesh always brings about death, worthless, destructive consequences that have no eternal value. Because it's hostile to God, Romans 8. We do not need to live self-centered lives. What we do need to do is live humble lives. Humble ourselves by stating that serving ourselves is not good. In a sense, this is what dying to self essentially means. In order to be able to be in God's will, we have to be out of our own will. We recognize that serving self is not good, so we choose to serve the Spirit. Our commitment to saying no to the old nature actually comes only to the degree that we are sure of the old nature's total rebellion against God, and we desire to serve the Spirit. The Christian life is based on humble living, folks, and when we're living to humble ourselves by looking at the facts of what self-service does, then we're willing to walk in the ways of God. Our spiritual growth comes as we recognize uh, the complete rebellious nature of the flesh and the power of the new life through the life of Christ. Now, the Christian needs to acknowledge the flesh, declare it lou its lousy nature, reject it, it, uh, its promptings, acknowledge the Lord's presence and the beautiful nature of the Spirit, and surrender one's total heart and will to the Spirit's leading. Here's a possible prayer one might pray while having an early morning meditation. Dear Lord, my allegiance to you will be tested today. Right now, I'm stating my faithfulness to you. You are the one I love forever. At the same time, I will clearly state that I want nothing to do with serving myself. I have had enough to do with that selfish ego of mine that tries to get all the attention it can. Your principles of love and giving are what I want. Radiate in my life through acts and words of kindness. Forgive me of my sin and cleanse me. I may make myself totally emptied of self so that you can fill me with your humble paths of love. All right. So that's, that's an idea of what you could pray. Personally, my prayer is, and I always do this, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, today, uh, as I come into contact with every person that I meet, let them see all of you and none of me. In Jesus' name, amen. So how do we get to a place where we can say to God, not my will, but thy will be done? 
Jesus had a consistent prayer life that kept him in tune with God. So let's recount the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Matthew 4, verses 1 through 16. Hebrews 4, verses 16, 15 and 16. After Jesus fasted for 40 days and nights, the temp tempter approached him. Jesus knew the only way to combat the enemy of God was through prayer, fasting, and scripture. So these same three ingredients will keep a child of God in tune with him. Prayer, fasting, and study of the word are the key ingredients to crucifying the flesh that the spirit within might live. When we pray, fast, and study God's word, then our will and God's will will line up together. God's word opens blind eyes and reveals to us what God's will is for our lives and gives us the ability to deny the flesh and obey his spirit. The problem with most believers today is that they are committed to this world and not the things of God. Everything is about what we want and not about what God wants. The flesh is running rampant in the Christian world today and the devil was not successful in getting Jesus to succumb to temptation because Jesus was strengthened in his resolve to withstand through prayer and fasting. This is the essence of spiritual warfare. Jesus fought it when he was on earth and we're fighting it today. And the weapons he used are the same ones we must use, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. So what are some of the practical implications of dying to self? I mean, what does it look like in practice? Reflect upon the following. Number one, dying to oneself does not involve sacrifice. What? Dying to oneself does not involve sacrifice. Though it may seem like it, it actually involves more of seeking God's will, which reflects the attitude of the heart, rather than obeying his will over our own. Okay? So, consider that. And, um... Well, piffle. Okay. Uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, and uh, Matthew 9, verse 13, and 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 7. Number two, dying to oneself involves being motivated by love. You can obey God out of fear as opposed to love, and though you obey him, it, it won't result in lasting, life-giving benefits. Okay? The obedience of the believer needs to be motivated by love. We must strive to obey God because we love him and don't want to grieve him or cause him pain. We must not make our wanting to avoid pain our chief motivation. <laughs> okay, Dying to self, number three, involves mercy. When someone cuts off in traffic, off in traffic and makes you angry, you have to choose to be merciful. Do not just, don't, don't just be, well, not just because it's the right thing to do but also to keep us from getting ourselves stuck in a foxhole of anger and bitterness. Common sense tells us that sinful responses produce painful consequences. The more we practice doing the right thing, the less we will suffer from doing the wrong thing. Therefore, choose mercy and experience God's blessing uh, instead, of, um, instead of the other. Uh, you know, you die to self, folks. Matthew 5, 7 and for 44, uh, uh, Matthew 18, verse 33, uh, 22, verse 39, and Hebrews 10, verse 30. Okay. Humility is the path to death. The essence of humility is the giving up of self and taking the place of perfect nothingness before God. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, Philippians 2, verse 8. In death he fully surrendered his will to the will of the Father. In death he gave up his self. With its natural reluctance to drink the cup, he gave up his life. If it had not been for his boundless humility, counting himself as nothing except as a servant to do the suffer, to do and suffer the will of God, he never would have gone to the cross, and we would still be in our sins. So how do we die to ourselves? Well, Andrew Murray puts it this way. The death, of itse the death itself is actually not our work. It is God's work. In Christ we are dead to sin. Romans 6, 3, verse 11. The life that is in us has already gone through the process of death and resurrection. Therefore, we can be sure that we are indeed dead to sin. If we are to enter into full fellowship with Christ in his death and to know full deliverance from self, we must humble ourselves. This is our one duty. We must stand before God in utter helplessness and consent heartily to the fact that we are important to slay ourselves. We are impotent to slay ourselves. We must sink down in our own nothingness and in the spirit of meek, uh, meekness and patience surrender to God. God accepts such humbling of ourselves as the proof that our whole heart truly desires it. 
thus preparing us for his mighty work of grace that transforms us into his likeness. It's the path of humility that ultimately leads us to the full realization that we indeed are dead in Christ. The death of self has no surer mark than a humility which makes itself of no reputation, which empties out itself, and which takes the form of a servant. What a hopeless task it would be if we had to do the work ourselves. Now we must simply claim in the faith the death and the life of Jesus as being ours and humble ourselves every day into that perfection, uh, into that perfect helpless dependence upon God. As we sink every morning into the deep, deep nothingness of the grave of Jesus, every day the life of Jesus will manifest in us. And this is what he states. The souls that enter into his humiliation will find in him the power to see and count, se count self dead and to walk with all lowliness and meekness. Now, knowing that, ultimately only God can make us grow. The Apostle Paul helps us keep this in perspective when he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God, I planted, Apollos watered, but God caused the growth. 1 Corinthians 3.16 God causes the growth, my friends, but we need to do the planting and the watering. We're supposed to tend the garden. And it's in us now. We have a vital role in how much we grow in the Lord. Our part is to cooperate with Him by planting the truth in our hearts and watering it, directing our hearts towards God. Through the prayerful study of His Word, we must be at the core of how we live the Christian life. Scripture gives us the following injunctions. Train yourself to be godly, 1 Timothy 4, verse 7. And sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, 1 Peter 3, 15. It is vital that we direct our hearts and desires back to God and away from earthly sources. This is the essence of dying to self. It's because our hearts are so prone to wander that directing our heart toward God must become an essential part of our life every day. Remember that God told his people in Israel, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. 2 Chronicles 7.14 Scripture is very clear on our need to direct our hearts toward God, folks. Spiritual growth will result when we apply discipline to maintain our faith, hope, and love toward God. So if we apply these uh, um, dis disciplines out of a sense of duty, we will continue to languish spiritually. We're not under the law. Our discipline must be a discipline of delight toward God. Remember, dying to self isn't the goal. Life is the goal. Carrying our cross is not the, an end in itself. Dying is the path to real living. So, <clears throat> by dying to our earthly ways, we, exi we exit the darkness and enter into the light, and there is where we experience times of refreshing and life to the full in the presence of God. Remember, God dwells in the light, not darkness. You know, George Muller, known for his great faith and ministry to orphans in the 19th century in England, was asked the secret of his fruitful service for the Lord. He said, There was a day when I died, utterly died. As he spoke, he bent lower and lower until he almost touched the floor. I died to George Muller. His opinions, his preferences, his tastes, and his will died to the approval or blame, even of my brethren and friends, and since then I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. You know, I had this same kind of experience. I was about to give my opinion to my congregation one Sunday as I was delivering the sermon, the Word of God, and the Lord muted my tongue and I couldn't speak. So I stepped away from the pulpit and turned my back on the congregation, and I said in my mind, uh, because I couldn't speak, Lord, what's going on with me? What's the matter here? Help me. Uh, am I sick? Am I <laughs> having a stroke? What's going on? And the Lord said, you were about to give your opinion of the Word of God. He said, you're not entitled to your own opinion unless it's mine. So I said, okay. I get it. Thank you, Lord. And I went back to the pulpit. He loosed my tongue, and I spoke only what God said about the Word of God. Now, Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, had this to say about dying to self. Everyone I know who has been greatly used by God has gone through an experience of dying to self, as described in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He goes on to say that it is not until we know the reality of death to self that we can live for Christ, allowing God to truly use and bless us. Uh, my Galatians 2.20 experience, writes Bill Bright, uh, happened in the spring of 1951 when Vonette, his wife, and I signed a contract to become slaves to Christ. 
I daily reaffirm this contract. Holy living involves a daily decision to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. It involves yielding our will to God and adopting His perspectives. If you want to see what it looks like to live a holy life, examine the life of Jesus. He is the visible expression of God's holiness. God wants our minds and hearts to be filled with His holy qualities. As our lives are transformed, we will project the light of His holiness into the darkness of our evil world. Real life, abundant life, begins with dying to self. Dying to self is a liberating action that produces joy and peace. You know, there's other noteworthy quotes as well that I, I'm going to share with you because it's important for you to get, a, get an idea of what this really means, dying to self. Okay. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Charles Spurgeon says, I have now concentrated well, all my prayers into one, that I may die to self and live wholly to him. Martin Luther said, until a man is nothing, God can make nothing out of him. J.I. Packer, Jesus Christ demands self-denial, that is, self-negotiation, as a necessary condition of discipleship. Self-denial is a summons to summit, submit to the authority of God as Father and of Jesus as Lord, accepting death to everything that is carnal, self wants to possess, is what Christ summons to self-denial. And, and, uh, so, and that's what self-denial is all about. Thomas A. Kempis the more a man dies to himself, the more he begins to live unto God. D.L. Moody. Let God have your life. He can do more with it than you can. Um, Arthur Pink. Growth in grace is the forming of a lower estimate of self ourselves. It is a deepening realization of our nothingness. Ignatius. St. Ignatius. Few souls understand what God would accomplish in them if they were to abandon themselves unreservedly to him. Richard Sibbies. Self-emptiness prepares us for spiritual fullness. Richard Baxter, self is the most treacherous enemy and the most insinuating deceiver in the world. Of all other vices, it, bo it is both the hardest to find out and the hardest to cure. Vance Havner, some missionaries bound for Africa were laughed at by the boat captain who said, you'll only die over there, replied a missionary. Captain, we died before we started. Now, um, You know, we have to be broken, okay? Spiritually broken before we can die to self. I mean, that's what happens, has to happen. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about the wholeness of brokenness, uh, if I'm going to have enough time, <laughs> okay? But let me, um, let me see what I can do. The word broken generally conjures up a negative image in our minds, and something that is broken is usually not wanted and is considered useless to us. When talking about a person, someone who's described as broken is usually in dire straits and at a precarious point in, the, in his or her life. No one wants to be broken. In God's dictionary, however, brokenness is a crucial characteristic for a Christian. In David's psalm of repentance, after he was confronted by the prophet Nathan for his adulterous liaison with Bathsheba and his successfully uh, murderous plan for her husband Uriah, David said to the Lord, you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it, nor are you pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. Now, in another psalm, David expresses the joy of God's forgiveness. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, verse 18. Now, additionally, the prophet Isaiah said, For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of the spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Isaiah 57, verse 15. Then finally, in Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verse 3. The poor in spirit are those who are spiritually broken. Spiritual a scripture, I'm sorry. Scripture makes it very clear that spiritual brokenness is very important to the Lord. So what exactly is spiritual brokenness? Well, one thing that it's not is it's not walking around with a gloomy face wailing, woe is me, because you've been getting the short end of the stick in life. No, brokenness is understanding the fact that without God, you're spiritually bankrupt. It's totally giving up on yourself, dying to self, and giving him the reins of your life. Surrender and brokenness go hand in hand, my friends. Spiritual brokenness is surrendering your will to God. Spiritual brokenness is knowing that without God, you are and can do absolutely nothing. 
It's a total desperate dependence on him in every aspect of life. It's a cry from the depths of your soul that shouts, God, I need you. I want you. I can't live without you. You're everything to me. Now, the concept of spiritual brokenness is not a popular topic in most Christian circles, and it's very pretty much ignored in most churches because it sounds negative. However, brokenness is anything but negative. It's the way to the heart of God. So think for a moment about a wild stallion that a rancher buys. It's strong, beautiful, and wild, and it calls the shots and does what it wants. It has enormous potential to the rancher, but in its wild state, it's not useful to him. So the master must break the horse of its will. To be sure, the horse doesn't like the breaking process and fights the rancher with all he has. But after a long and tedious process, the beautiful wild horse is finally broken and fully surrendered to his master and can now fulfill the purpose for which the rancher purchased him. Also, before it is broken, the wild stallion will not sit still long enough to experience the gentle caress and loving care of his master. But after it's broken, it now understands just how much his master loves him and experiences his warm embrace and gentle care. You and I are like that, like wild stallions, created with lots of potential, nevertheless wild as a march hare. We call the shots and our will takes center stage. But when we trust Christ as our Savior... We are purchased by our master. He begins the long process of breaking us of our will so that he can be in control. Like the wild horse, we don't like the breaking process. It hurts and we fight against God with all our strength. After all, we want to be in charge. For some, unfortunately, they fight him all their lives and never come to the point of being fully broken and miss out on the most important thing in life, intimacy with God. However, for those of us who are finally broken of self, we become useful to God, we bear much fruit, and fulfill the destiny that He has planned for us in this life. Most importantly, we come into an intimate, loving relationship with our Master, and we are each on the journey of brokenness. Have you reached that point in life when you're now fully understanding that God is everything, absolutely everything in your life? Have you surrendered your will to Him so that His will for you is all you desire? Brokenness is the only way to holiness, and wholeness and it's God's purpose for your life. I'm going to stop here today, and we'll pick this up on uh, tomorrow, and we'll start talking about the valley of spiritual brokenness. Uh, so I'm going to mark this here, because right now we have to uh, run out of time. We've run out of time. And now, um, I just want to say to you that following this program, right here on Spreaker.com, if you just stay tuned, is living the word. Pastor Karen Weitzman and I will teach you uh, how to apply the word of God and its teachings from 2,000 years ago, all of these principles, attributes, and, and uh, commands and, and whatnot, how to put those in your life today and manage them instead of tossing them out or not doing them because you don't understand them. So stay tuned with us right here on Spreaker.com and in... Uh, about 30 minutes, you'll come to here listen, uh, Living the Word with Pastor Karen Weitzman and myself, Dr. Stephanie. God bless you, and I will, um, I'll see you tomorrow.